In this episode of This Week in Photo, it's all about storage. This is Twitter. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. This episode is about something that affects pretty much everybody that does any kind of digital stuff online, you know, including photographers. And I would argue creative professionals are most affected by the decisions they make when it comes to storage. So uh, my friend, Jeffrey Totaro, who's an architectural photographer, has walked over the hot coals for us and architected, no pun intended, he has architected a really solid and robust system for dealing with the images that he's working on and clients and all that good stuff. So, uh oh. Okay. Interesting. I'm hearing my power supply flick on and off. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Your UPS? My UPS, yes, yeah, yeah, it's over here. Too. Yeah, no, no. that's all right. Okay, as long as it's done, yeah, that's all right. right, yeah. Let, let me continue this. Here we go. So let me just finish that up. Okay, okay. So we get to be the beneficiaries of Jeffrey basically walking over hot coals and figuring all this stuff stuff out for us. So what I did, Jeffrey and I had a conversation and what he did was he put together a kind of a training tutorial presentation that kind of covers what he did and what his setup looks like and he's going to share it with you today so first of all jeffrey tataro welcome to this or welcome back to this week in photo it's good to have you back again oh thanks very much frederick always good to see you i appreciate you having me on the show absolutely and, um yeah i just have some information i thought it'd be helpful to share i, I went through uh, went through this process of uh having to renovate my storage and backup uh solution just about a year ago and so my system's been up for about a year and it's been it's been really good so yeah i thought i'd share it today all right well uh, yeah i'm excited to see it you were you and i were talking offline a little bit before we started recording um it, part of your presentation covers drobo right from data robotics that storage mm -hmm. the storage robot as they used to call it um i used to work there many many moons ago for a short time so i have a or had a special affinity in my heart for drobos and i have two here and uh, you know it, uh, this was not planned but one of my drobos died just recently and it, it was the you know <laughs> i had two drobos one yep. was main and one was backup and i had carbon copy cloner doing the you know the doing its thing every night now i'm running on one nacelle here so <laughs> so right, right, this right. this presentation is very appropriate for me and very timely in fact based on your recommendation i'll likely you know get whatever you tell me to get you know and replace my drobo <laughs> setup with a real setup so yeah yeah, this is this okay. is gonna be good. Yeah, yeah. This, yeah, I'm excited. You've been teasing, I think, throughout the year, sending pictures of different things that you've implemented. You know, I've seen I've seen glimpses of the yep. brilliance. I haven't seen the brilliance right. in its entirety <laughs> yet, so I'm looking forward to it. Right. So yeah, yeah. So no, yeah, so you want to? I'm just gonna turn it over to you and let you let you roll with okay. it and teach us what you've sure. what you've discovered about storage. No problem. That sounds good, Frederick. Yeah, okay. I have I have a short presentation. I think. Um, we can certainly talk about the nuts and bolts of all the different hardware and things that we'll, we'll get into. But today I thought it'd be helpful, especially to talk about just overall strategy and certainly some of the products I've been using and uh, just different ways to set it up. So what I have is a, a, a somewhat complex system, but it can be scaled way, way down uh, to someone who's either just starting out or maybe just wants to dip a toe in and see how it goes. Uh, but I've been, I've been dipping my toes in storage solutions for um 20 years pretty much so i've been uh th through a lot of different parts and pieces so what i wanted to start with was and in fact if you can see clearly enough the slide there's a the, the top uh dvd there says italy 2003 so that just happened to be at the top of the stack but it was actually probably the first real digital camera experience and that wasn't even camera it was all scans that's what was really a transition so it was a personal trip to uh, Italy back in 2003, where I shot film with the um, Nikon, I think, F100 that I owned for about two months before I said, oh, I'm done with this, and I moved over to digital, uh, at least for personal things. So it's kind of interesting that, that that particular DVD happens to be on on top of the stack. So yeah, back in 2003, I was kind of in a hybrid mode with, with film, shooting film, scanning film. Uh, so I'd started to have you know, a lot of digital files to deal with. So 
Yeah, back then it was burn DVDs, maybe burn two DVDs, maybe keep one set off site. Uh, it was a lot of hassle and none, none of it was automated in terms of being able to back things up. So um, so those of you who are, who are younger kind of have avoided that and that's certainly a good thing. So as, as I got more and more into uh, digital photography and, and transitioned the professional work probably I think about 2004, uh, when I switched to, I switched from four by five film and scanning, uh, cause I shoot architecture and interior. So four by five film was the, was the tool we used and then scanning that film, uh, as a deliverable to the client and then to be able to make some adjustments. We didn't do a lot of Photoshop work back then other than, than color. Uh, but then quickly, uh, the storage became, you know, a question well, we're going to, how are we going to store all these different photos? And what's the best way to to back them up? You know, anyone who's thought about digital storage knows that you know it's best to have three copies. It doesn't exist unless it's three copies of it, and preferably on two different media. Um, I break a little bit of that rule, as you'll see in a minute. But I do have um, so back then. This this is like literally just a shelf in my basement of sort of expired hard drives, and these have been either in uh, Drobo, like you mentioned, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Or my first digital storage solution was something from um, uh, Otherworld Computing, uh, OWC. Back when I had one of the, uh, an older Mac Pro, I got a, a, a SATA card. So it was a card you stuck in the computer, that, which allowed you to connect um, SATA drives, which are SATA is the, the connection protocol that most uh, spinning hard drives attach to computers with. And so, but they had an external enclosure. So I had an external enclosure that held like four or five uh, of the, you know, regular spinning hard drive, but then they were like, they were 125 gigabytes maybe at that time or less. And so you had to have multiple ones of those. And if you wanted copies of it, you need maybe a whole second tower of those to copy things back and forth and trying to find older files was like, well, wait a minute, what's on what drive? And, you know, nothing was really, the drive itself is searchable, but you don't know what's on one of the drives that's not in the tower. So it was just a, a big nightmare and it was a lot of, a lot of learning, you know, this represents only some of the hard drives I happen to have in my basement. Uh, so there's a lot of, a lot of back and forth of how, how, you know, I was thinking about what the best solution was. This, uh, for a time was my off site solution. So these are literally a Pelican case full of hard drives. It probably weighs like 75 pounds. And so I would take th this box, uh, over to, uh, I work with an organization called wonderful machine. They used to be located not too far down the street from me. And they um, just allowed me to have a shelf on the in their closet to store my 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 offsite solution for um, files. So I would I would go there and I would switch these drives out every every I don't know three six months or whatever I felt doing. So again, very manual process, really really not very reliable. Definitely down to a lot of human error. And you know it's a ton of ton of different hard drives, and it was just a pain in the neck. You know, you didn't really, no one, you never really wanted to say, "Oh, let me go over there and get those hard drives and swap them out." No, um, you know, it's definitely like a, it's, you know, it's, it's worse than than any other life task you can imagine. <laughs> um, so for for a while, uh, I switched over, and actually it was Frederick, I think, and because he used to work with Drobo and some other earlier podcasts in Frederick's career, and maybe guest on this week and. Um, uh, or Mac Break Weekly, perhaps, where he may have mentioned this kind of thing. Uh, so Drobo was a really cool idea. So it was, a, they called it a storage robot. And this was, um, in, in terms of my use of it, an early form of RAID, which is a redundant array of independent disks, which was a way to put a bunch of, of, of hard drives together in one enclosure and have them share all the storage across all the hard drives. And the big benefit was that you could lose a hard drive. It could completely fail and you wouldn't lose any data because it's, it's doing something called RAID 5, which, so if you had, if you had four 10 terabyte drives, one of those drives uh, would, could fail and then you wouldn't lose any of the remaining uh, data you had on. You lose one drive's worth of storage uh, capacity to what they call parity to allow that to work. But I remember at the Photo Expo in New York years ago when Drobo would have a booth there, their their big party trick was to have a like 4K, maybe it wasn't even 4K at that time, but a, a live video on a TV screen. And they would just pop a drive out of Drobo and it would keep playing because that that's how the system worked. 
So, <clears throat> yeah, Jeffrey, um, and they they even had dual disk redundancy. They had a little checkbox in the preferences yeah. w where you could check and and have up to two. I mean, you would lose space, you know, storage space, but you know, you could have up right. to two drives fail, which was what sold me on it, right? And yeah, yeah. No, I mean they they were terrific in that regard. So. The one I have pictured here is one of their five bay models, and another shelf in my basement is another five bay model. Uh, and then the cardboard box above is one of their eight bay models, and there's actually another one of theirs in my basement somewhere. But they worked great. But they they were a category of storage called called uh, direct attached storage or DAS, and we're going to talk about something coming up called uh, network attached storage. Which I don't know if Drobo ever got into. They may have. They may have gotten into it a little bit, but they were they mostly did. in the direct yeah. attached. Yeah, yeah, the the five in the in series of Drobos were network attached. Okay, God, I figured they did. Uh, yeah. But I always stuck just direct attached ones. So basically, it's just a giant uh, hard drive that you can attach to your computer, and it's but it's only attached. You can only use it for the computer that it's attached to, or potentially access it through your local network. Uh, and you know, you definitely had that, that sort of safety of uh, a potential drive failure and you wouldn't lose anything. So that was very appealing and they, they work well for a while. Like the, the eight bay one on the cardboard box, that's actually a replacement one where, cause the power supply died in the one I had and it was out of warranty and it was out of production or something even. So I couldn't even get, um, replacement parts from Drobo for it. That was kind of my first inkling that oh, I'm not sure about this company. Um, cause they wouldn't even help me out to replace it. So I bought, I just bought another unit off of eBay, uh, used one and I was able to just take the drives, uh, and pop them into, into the new one. And it worked thankfully because it was just, my system was down, you know, I didn't have a, I didn't have access to that one. So the way I was running it was the, um, the small five bay was sort of my second, second step in the digital workflow where I would have, um, a, a, a similar kind of RAID setup, but, but SSD RAID in the computer. And that would copy every day through something called Chronosync. And I'll, I'll, I'll provide a bunch of links uh, to some things I'll talk about here. So Chronosync is a nice app that allows you to, to easily sync between, you can do one-way sync uh, or two-way sync. And so I was doing mostly one-way sync because everything that was done on the computer was then just pushed over to the Drobo and and it would just stay there. I guess it would. No, maybe I did do two way sync on this. Yeah, I think I did. But uh, regardless, so that that was that was synchronizing uh, just on a schedule, right? So I think I did it once a day or something like that. That it would it, overnight or something. It, it would it would look to the SSD RAID inside the computer, and then it would just synchronize over to the to the smaller Drobo, and then at a different time of the night, the smaller Drobo would sync to the bigger Drobo. And so, and that worked well, everything I, I knew I had extra copies of everything. Uh, so any, any given digital job, um, while the job was still active, I would have it on the laptop, I would have it on the computer on the SSD and I'd have it on two Drobos. So I'd have like four copies of it within 24 hours of the shoot. So that, that was, that was a nice feeling that, that it was backed up, but I still didn't have a, a good solution for what to do about like an offsite or at least an offline backup. So I essentially got for the eight bay Drobo, I had, um, uh, in the, in the case to the right in this slide was a, a duplicate set of drives. So I'm still back to the idea of, so this one only lived in my basement. It didn't live over offsite technically, but it lived on a high shelf and a waterproof case in my basement, uh, my basement, which would never flood because it's actually at grade. But, um, so every three months or so, I would physically swap the hard drives. So there's eight hard drives in this case. I would physically remove them from the big Drobo and, and put these guys in and then ask Chronosync to sync everything from the small Drobo. And so, and that worked well. It just, again, it wasn't automated in, in terms of having another solution. And I still didn't have anything offsite. And then I started to run into some, some big issues with, the Drobo that said the small Drobos, uh, one of them completely died and I just, you know, got a different one, the next, uh, most available one I got and implemented that and it was working fine, but they, they definitely had some weird issues where they wouldn't mount, uh, cause again, they're direct attached. And so I was really starting to have a problem and starting to get a little panicked. And this was just over a year ago. 
And so I was using this system up, up until then. And so I really started to panic. I'm not sure what's going on. And probably a year before that, I did buy a Synology because I thought, let me learn about this thing because I heard, um, I think Andy Anatko on Mac Weekly had mentioned that he used one. I'm like, I didn't know anything about it. I'm like, let me get one of those things and see what that's about. Um, I'll, I'll tell you more detail about it. But so I just barely scratched the surface of what to do with those things. But I started to look more intently at it. So uh, Frederick and I were just talking uh, before the show started. Uh, so this is the current page of Drobo. So as of January 27th, Drobo support and products no longer available. <laughs> so this was sort of coming uh, even a year ago. People were online were saying that they thought they had gone out of business, essentially, uh, in terms of support and things like that. So, so now it's, it seems to be official and, and as of not that long ago. So I'm, I'm glad I had figured something else out. Because um, yeah. I never thought their support was very good to begin with, at least not in my experience. And they didn't need to provide much hardware support in terms of parts and things like that, uh, again, yeah. in my experience. This support so, support has been horrible. The support, it just went... yeah you know, down into the drain, unfortunately. And I think this, I think, you know, if I'm the target market, you know, of people that are still mm -hmm. limping al along with their Drobos and like, oh, it still works. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. This yep. is a, is a big flare in the sky saying it's broke and yeah. you need to, you need to find <laughs> safe Harbor, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Cause yeah. yeah cause if the machine goes down, you got to hope to find one on, on bay or something or, or, you mm -hmm. know, I don't know if, if you can scrape together some parts or who knows what <laughs> right so. yeah so this is this is good a drobo there's no more there's no more ambiguity drobo is officially dead right so now Dope. go find yeah. some place else yep. for your bits <laughs> yep no totally because right. yeah it's a, now's the time so they had some good they had some good stuff in the beginning and, and uh throughout their run but i'm not sure what happened yeah um, yeah along the way but, uh, but, who knows yeah back to you yeah all right cool um, so yeah, so now I've switched over to using uh, systems that are network attached storage, so NES instead of direct attached, which uh, DAS like the Drobo was, or the Drobo was I used. So Synology is a, a company that's been around for a while, and they specialize in this sort of uh, storage, and they make everything from a two-bay box, which would essentially allow you to have two identical hard drives sitting in the box and one would mirror the other. And that would be the simplest sort of backup that they, they would make um, in terms of backing up. I mean, in terms of uh, allowing a drive to fail and you still wouldn't lose any 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 data. And those units are pretty inexpensive. Um, they're, I think, in the $300 range. Mm -hmm. And then they, they have units all the way up to full rack-mounted, you know, petabyte systems that are just, you know, crazy enterprise kind of stuff. So. They, they run the full gamut of being able to provide a ton of different solutions, and there's a, a huge amount of um, specs to follow and, and try and get the right machine for what, what you're trying to do. But I'll just show you a little bit about what I got into. So this is the, the rack that I built um, it, that sits in my basement. And so uh, first I have to give uh, complete uh, acknowledgement to uh, a guy on YouTube named Will Yarborough who runs a uh, site there called, or a channel there called Space Rex. And he is a total um, storage nerd and knows, um, knows certainly way more than I do about the nuts and bolts of it. And he helped me a lot with putting the system together. I physically built the system. Uh, I knew enough about the strategy I wanted to deploy, but then he helped me just figure out the exact steps to take to do it. And I'll talk more about that. But uh, so the black boxes at the lower half of the rack are three different Synology units. The, the top one is a, is a four bay unit. So there's four hard drives in there. That is actually the offsite solution for a friend of mine. So he's got, uh, another Synology in his office and I helped him with, um, uh, his, um, you know, just backing up all digital assets. And so, um, those two machines sync together. The one below that is an eight bay and that's my primary Synology unit. So these work the same way that the Drobo in the sense that when you first populate with, with hard drives, you have to select what um, type of storage pool, as they call it, that you want to have. And so it's basically a RAID 5, which means that uh, one of the drives can fail and you won't lose any data. Um, I use that they have their own proprietary system called Synology Hybrid RAID which is uh, also a little bit similar to Drobo in the theory that you could mix drives of different sizes if you needed to. So even if you bought an 8-bay unit, you could start with as few as two drives. 
of that they have to be the same size, uh, or at least it'll work based on the size of the smallest one. And then you can add drive. So the SHR, the, the uh, Synology Hybrid RAID, allows you to expand versus, to my understanding, that uh, RAID 5 you would have to set up, you'd have to populate it with eight drives of equal size and call it RAID 5 and that's it. Um, versus the SHR, if you populated it with all, say, 10 terabyte drives, and then you're like, well, I need more storage, you could slowly start replacing one at a time with larger drives and, and the system would just adapt and rebuild itself as you would do one by one replacing drives. So a very similar kind of kind of system in, in that regard. But again, this is network attached. So that gives you a huge amount of opportunities. And so I'll come back to this photo at the end and we can talk a little bit more about it. But what I want to talk about here, this is my whole strategy, right? So I'm going to walk through some slides. This this page is going to fill up with some more some more components and things. So when I come um well, I'll start with the Mac Studio. So the Mac Studio is my computer, my office, and uh, external to that because everything's external. Mac Studio. I have uh, a box that holds um, a a RAID card. So it basically has four NVMe. Um, uh, those are the M.2 drives that are uh, basically SSD storage, and those are RAIDed together. So this is a similar kind of RAID where uh, the, you're taking advantage of putting, putting um, four hard drives together to expand the capacity. But this is not in a RAID 5. This is, a, I believe it's a RAID 0, RAID 1, where they're striped together. So it basically gives you additional storage. So it's four times two in my case. So it's eight terabytes of space. But they're striped together. So the RAID writes across every drive and reads across every drive simultaneously. And so it gives you incredible speed. So this, this little black box yields six gigabytes per second of throughput to the Mac Studio. So I don't do a lot of video editing, but when I do, it's crazy fast. And it's plenty fast for photo editing. So it's, it's, it's quite good for that. So the Mac Studio and the little SSD RAID, I show a picture here of one that's actually by OWC, which I provide a link to. Because uh, the other one, a Sonnet, is um, good, but I think it's just a more expensive one. So basically that's the setup in the office. So when I come back from a shoot, uh, I shoot to my laptop, I shoot Tether to Capture One all the time. So we have a Capture One session, which is just a nice single folder that contains all the, all the, um, all the raw files in a nice organized way. So basically I copy the session from the MacBook Pro and it copies over to the SSD and then I could start immediately start working on it on the Mac Pro. But then uh, in order to back it up, I then copy down to the, so the Synology, the, the 8-bay one that's in the, in the rack. And they, so again, they make different ones. They make rack-mounted ones, the RS, and they make a DS for disk station, which is uh, the one you saw at the bottom. It looks more like a desktop-mounted one. So I use something here. Um, Synology makes tons of apps, and the third parties make tons of apps for Synology machines. So they make something called Synology Drive which is basically a synchronization utility. So I set it up that uh, as soon as something hits that SSD RAID, it's immediately copied to the Synology. So it's not doing it like the Drobo was like once overnight, for instance. And so as soon as I make one little change in, in, in uh, Capture One, it's immediately copied to the Synology. And that may seem like a lot of overhead, but it, it's super, super fast because everything when I get some more pieces on the screen, everything that's connected to the Synologies and the computer all runs over a 10 gigabit ethernet connection. So most ethernet connections are one gigabit and that's not gigabyte, that's gigabit. So a one gigabit connection can yield about 125 megabytes per second because there's eight, there's eight bits in a byte. So your uh, cable company doesn't want you to think that because they want you to think you're getting a gigabyte per second, but you're not. Um, so 10 gigabit is a one gigabit connection, a gigabit connection. So everything copies quite quickly over to the technology. So it's backed up. And when I first learned about drive, I was like a little apprehensive. I'm like, well, what if I make a mistake or I delete something I didn't want to delete? Cause that's a two way sync. So as soon as I would delete something from the Mac studio, it would just, it would knock it off the Synology. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, that's not good. I, you know, I delete things incorrectly. All the time. Um, so I was, I was worried about that, but they have you covered in two ways in that regard. So 
you basically have a, a trash folder, they call it recycled in on the Synology. So you can, even if you delete something in your preferences on the Synology, you say, well, don't empty the recycle bin for 30 days. I have mine set to. So you can easily go, but you can just navigate to it. It's not hidden somewhere. It's not in some proprietary format. It doesn't take time to find it. You just navigate to it, go to recycle bin, and then it has like your entire folder tree there of anything that's been deleted. And you can just go grab it and move it back to your to the other folder. So it's super easy in that regard. And then they have this whole other system, which uh, I won't be able to explain all the details of how it works, but it's called Synology um, Snapshots. So it, you can basically revert your system to where it was yesterday or two days ago or a month ago. And you'll basically have everything as it was then. So if you did some serious damage or maybe your entire system got crippled or something, you could actually just roll it back to its to a, to a previous state. And I don't know how it does it in terms of why it doesn't use up a ton of storage, but it does allow you to do that. So there, uh, there, there's the combination of the recycle bin and snapshots makes me feel like I'm not going to lose anything that I accidentally delete. So it, it pretty much takes care of the human error part of it, which is really what I was looking to do. I wanted all this to be fully automated and not be able to not have to think about, well, let me make sure I copy this over and let me go make sure I have two copies of that thing. So this, uh, again, it's constantly syncing back and forth and uh, you can see, you can totally monitor and see what it's up to. So that's that's the uh, the primary backup solution. So on the SSD RAID, if you go back to the top of the screen, you know, projects live on there for about six months, maybe, before I have to delete them. So the SSD RAID is a little bit of a revolving door. And so I'll take stuff off of there. Uh, but then it all still lives on the Synology. And then, but that's only one copy, essentially, after six months or so, that's just one copy. So what I did, I had this, I had this machine previously uh, before I got the rack station model. So, and just a quick aside. So Synology's nomenclature is, is kind of, once you understand it, it makes sense. So RS-21 plus means that that unit can uh, eventually hold 12 drives, even though it's built for four, but you can add a four bay expansion unit. And then the 21 is the year that it came out. So it's a, it's a unit that can hold 12 drives made in 2021. The one below it is a disk station that uh, natively comes with eight drives, but you can add two five bay expansion units to it. Um, they're cabled, you know, they just attach with a cable to it. And that unit came out in, in 2017. And uh, the plus is, I recommend only the plus units. The, some of the other ones are cheaper that don't say plus, but plus pretty much gets you something that Synology calls BTRFS which is just their very robust file system that allows the, the, um, the snapshots to take place and some other really good file management stuff to take place. So using uh, another app that Synology makes called Hyper Backup, the, um, the 1221 backs up to the 1817, then that's a once a day process. So you could set it to whatever you want. You could do it once a week or whatever. And so I think of that like if something more major goes wrong, at least I have some time before something bad hits the, the other backup. Uh, and I thought about even making it less often uh, just to maybe more thoroughly do that. And I think I have to check on it. I think I could actually leave it off and it would just do a wake on land, which means it would wake up when it's pinged. That So it would sort of go into a sleep mode, which might even be a little more safe for it if, if anything were to go wrong. So in my house, this is the setup. So I have um, two Synologies that, that duplicate each other pretty much. And everything I do as I'm doing it is copied uh, to the uh, to the rack mounted one. But I also and, have... And, and, and Jeff, uh, I was going to ask you before you continue, is the setup completely wireless or like the first mile yeah. from the MacBook Pro and that's that's a, your, your Ethernet cabled into that? Yeah, everything here is wired. Uh, and everything okay. I've shown you so far is all uh, 10 gigabit. So if I go back to the rack photo, I'll show you what that means a little bit. So you do, if you want to do 10 gigabit connection, you do need a special uh, ethernet switch and you need units, all G units that will support 10 gigabit. Um, the Mac Studio uh, natively supports uh, 10 gigabit, which is great. So you don't need mm -hmm. any kind of adapter. And the Synology, some of them support it natively. But the ones I have, um, and you're going to see one more in a second, um, all need an additional accessory card. So 
the Synology is very much a computer. It's not just a box that holds disk. So it's very much a computer that you can add. You can add RAM to it. You can add um, various accessory cards. And so one of the cards, accessory cards they make is a 10 gigabit connection. Okay. So, um, and even the MacBook Pro, I just recently started doing that as a as a wired connection right into the system. It actually, for simplicity, I have it going into the SSD RAID because that's pretty much where it goes. But it actually copies first to the Synology in the middle and copies back up to the SSD. Hmm. Um, that's not, that's just a little detail that doesn't really matter too much. That's just the, the physical workflow where like when I walk in my house, I can plug it into my basement right into a Ethernet port and it just copies over. Yep. Cool. So th this is all everything in my house. And but I have an associate photographer and my studio manager Brian uh, has been working with me for a few years. And so he lives across town. And we started working together before the pandemic, but we already started working as, as a, you know, work from home kind of a thing. Cause I work out of my house, he works out of his house. So we were all set up for that. But so I was excited about, you know, getting to know the Synology better cause I knew we could really exploit some of the, um, some of the benefits that it has here. So, so basically there's another Synology unit that lives in Brian's house and over the internet, our two Synologies sync together through the same Synology drive application. And it's also instantaneous. So, uh, in fact, just today I had another call with, um, my consultant, Will from SpaceRex, and cause I was having a speed problem and he immediately fixed it. So now it's like, I just did a test a few hours ago. So if I generate a 700 megabyte TIFF from my phase one camera, it's on Brian's unit in less than a minute. So, in other words, it copies from my Mac studio to my Synology to Brian's Synology over the internet in less than a minute. That's crazy. So and what, how much data was that again? Like around 700 megabytes is like one TIFF file. Okay. Yeah. 16 wow. bit TIFF. Yeah. And it's constantly saying, like, I use Capture One. And I don't know if, you, if you ever burrowed into all the folders in Capture One, there's all these little tiny setting files. And those are constantly syncing. So if you just make one one point of an adjustment in color temperature, you know, it's, it's sending files across cause it, it made a change. Do you, do you um, find, do you find that mm -hmm. you're able to, or is this in, in your workflow that you're both operating in capture one simultaneously and it's respecting those changes because it's fast enough or do you run the, the risk of corrupting something? You would run, we haven't put that to, to an extreme test, but it is mm -hmm. but the best workflow would be to not be working on the same capture one session. Mm -hmm. um, we can both be in Cap one, but we should be in different sessions. So if I ask Brian to work on a particular job, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of check in with him if I want to go poking around in there. Like, are you, are you, are you out of it or, you know, it's, uh, okay. where are you at with it? And there's no, there's um, no built in, mm -hmm. there's no built in like UI flags or anything like a padlock that appears on a session. If you've got it open and vice versa, kind of like what the DaVinci resolve no. is doing. Oh, I wasn't familiar with that. That that would be a, a mm. good idea, but I imagine that would be some coordination between uh, Capture One and perhaps Synology or whatever, just to know um, to know which session you're in. Uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Yes, we, that's sort of that might be sort of the only manual process that we have to go through. Is like, um, I, I I know for instance, you know, Brian, hey, work on the retouching on this job, and I just know to stay out of that folder. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, it, it, Synology it, will. It, um, yeah, uh, I was just going to say at a certain point, I guess. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking from a computer standpoint and technology, but at a certain point, you got to leave something for humans to do. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, I have yeah. some trouble here. <laughs> yeah. So cool. Uh, but it will come up because I see them come up every now and then it will throw in a file. It's, if it's not sure what to do in a sense, it, it will make a duplicate file and call it constant. So if it sees something that that doesn't look right, it'll it'll um, try and resolve it for you okay and it'll, sure it'll make are, what what does it name that duplicate sense. file because you, you broke up a little bit when you were saying the what it calls it uh it it, it calls it conflict so conflict it'll, it'll okay. add con yeah to the uh, file and, and you'll just see it. okay so yeah that does happen so uh but mm -hmm. we just try and stay out of, stay out of each other's way and that's um so then um further up the the tree here from in brian's house so he has the synology but then he has the same kind of, so he works primarily off the laptop with an external monitor. Uh, that's the prime computer. And then attached to that is the, uh, he's, this is where we use the OWC version of this, of this RAID uh, box. Mm -hmm. And so 
his um and, and so i'm only showing it flowing through the computer it's actually flowing more or less directly to the RAID, but it has to obviously go through the computer because that's how it's connected so this is um this is sort of the end of the trail here so with these three Synology units i have um basically one, once everything's off the raids like say a year from now um we have three copies of everything uh two in my house one in brian's house so we do have an off-site solution um i don't have a solution where there might be a different kind of media because i'm not sure what kind of different media you would use these days so i i still deliver all my final photos through dropbox so that is what i'm considering my fourth backup and that is it's only the finished photos and that I'm considering just another sort of, you know, sandbox thing on its own because it's not part of this system. So if something terrible were to happen, whatever's on Dropbox would be safe. Oh, interesting. Um, are, you using, and, are you also using Dropbox yeah. for client delivery at any point or is it this is yes. completely behind the scenes? No, the Dropbox is for client delivery. That's kind of the okay. only reason we use it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. okay. And you can do, you can set these units up to be your own sort of cloud and i've tested a little bit uh, i've just sent a few files here and there to, to people to say how how quickly does this download and i may not have had it set up correctly but it, it um it didn't download as quickly as i thought it should and also i, I don't want to be like you know this all runs in my house um my house has a generator but you know those don't always come on so I mean, i'm just thinking of like oh, i'm away for a week the power goes out the generator doesn't come on and, and so and clients can't get files right that's what i'm mm -hmm. thinking of yeah so yeah, so I'd just rather have, and Dropbox is super quick on my phone to like somebody emails and says, oh, can you resend those files? It's, you know, that's 10 seconds, you know, yeah, Dropbox it like search. That's the right tool. <laughs> if that absolutely feels like the right tool for that. And and it's it's off yep. of your premises. And if something, God forbid, mm -hmm. should happen to your house or you, you know, you don't want that yeah. infrastructure to be impacted, they, people can still access it, right? Yeah, hundred percent. So I'm, I'm going to continue to use Dropbox for just for that. And again, it's just the final files. I don't I don't upload anything else. And and for a while, like you know, before I got into this whole system, when I was using the Drobos for an offsite, I, I was trying through Backblaze and I forget some of the other ones. Um, these you know offsite storage uh, cloud backup services. Mm -hmm. I never got anywhere with any of them. I tried like three of them. I never got anywhere. Um, it, cause I, I mean, I have a lot of data, but still I was trying to upload, you know, small parts of it and their utilities would completely bog down the computer. Like the, the computers would be useless. Um, and th I just never had any luck. And what was, there was some system, what was the service that went out of business like five years ago? And they told everyone quick download your data before we turn the servers off. Oh, so there's that? been, there's been so many, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't right. know. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. So, I, don't, I don't remember. Yeah, there's been a couple, though. Yeah, so that's that's like a thing, you know. I mean, it could yeah. happen. Yeah, I absolutely. mean, hopefully Synology doesn't go the way of Drobo, but they're a much bigger company. Uh, they make way more products. They support them very well. And there's an enormous community out there of people who can help support. So I'm going to give another plug to to uh, Will Yarbrough at Space SpaceX. So he has an interesting story because he um, had some other job and he was just making YouTube videos about this stuff out of his own personal interest. And then he started to gain some traction and it, it dawned on him that, you know, um, he and his wife could just end up just running this consulting business that they do now. They'd make YouTube videos and uh, you can hire Will to help you uh, sort out all the details. So mm -hmm. I was interested in learning how to do it. So I, I, I might have gone a little further than than most people would in terms of actually trying to physically set it up and build the system. But he's available to help um, either strategize or give you nuts and bolts. So I've hired him by the hour like three or four times just to come through. And and, and so you just remotely connect and um, he can dig into the synologies there because they're super robust. There's millions of settings, oh, uh, wow. but also really straightforward if you want to just get started with it. Um, yeah, make sure make sure so, you link us to him as well. That that would be great because yep. that's yeah that's that's a magic bit right there. I'd be willing to pay for that if I'm yep. trying to get my my you know I hit a oh, brick definitely. wall and I can't understand how to get mm -hmm. X to be Y or vice versa. Just to have someone be yeah. able to remote into it and make it make it all okay it would be perfect. Exactly. No, he's he's super good, and I know he does. He will for for like money. Um, he will f manage your units all day long. Like, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, so you can pay him um, some, some money per month and then he'll completely manage the system remotely and just make sure everything's working. You don't have to, once it's set up, you know, the touch anything. Or you can be like me where like, I, I, I know enough to, 
to get some things done, but probably not enough or I might start making mistakes. And that's where I call them. Uh, like I had to do like a port forwarding thing on my, on my UDM pro, the router. And I wasn't quite sure how to do that. And I'm like, that's worth some money to pay Will and let him figure that out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So you don't, you don't, have any <laughs> you don't want to get in that situation where you finally call Will, but it's too late. And he's like, yeah, yep. you know, if you, <laughs> if you hadn't, if you hadn't clicked that button right there, you know, I would have yeah. been able to do something. Right. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, 100%. Yeah. 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 Let me show yeah. one last slide here. Um, so back to the rack. Um, and I don't think I can point to anything here, right? Or maybe I can. Oh, yeah, you can. Oh, I can. Okay. So if you can see my mouse, um, the little white um, sort of half rack unit thing here, this is the 10 gigabit switch, right? So it's connected back to, um, there's a whole other rabbit hole you can get into. So the silver components are made by a company called Unify. You don't need these. <laughs> I just went a little off the deep end. Um, <laughs> this is something called the EDM Pro, which is a, basically a super fancy router and um, has one hard drive because you can connect our cameras to it. So it's sort of like a, you know, can, it can do the video recording, um, but it's a crazy fancy router. And then one of their switches here but they also make this switch. So the reason I got into all of this is because I said, hey, Will, what's a good 10 gigabit switch? And he sent me a link to this one little box. And then before I knew it, I had all these other boxes. <laughs> yeah, um, right. So, but basically, so the, the, just for anyone who doesn't know, so the most, um, you, you, most computers these days would connect over a one gigabit connection over ethernet. And that, that's pretty standard these days. And most of the ports in these units are, or they are, are all, in fact, one gigabit connections. So, so if you want a faster connection, you have to connect um, this switch to your router, which is what this one cable is doing. And then once that's connected, then everything that flows into the switch can talk to each other over 10 gigabit. Right. So this switch doesn't make everything 10 gigabit. It only makes the four ports that are attached to it those four ports can talk to each other. So those are those four ports are my two Synologies, my uh, Mac Studio, and then also my my laptop in the sense that when I, I can plug it in in the basement to a 10 gigabit adapter so that my laptop can then talk to the whole system at 10 gigabit. So when I come back from a shoot, I plug it in there and I copy the, the latest shoot over to the system. Now, so everything that's in the next 10 gigabit. So, mm -hmm. so blazingly fast speeds, right? So to copy, like you, you were saying that 17, what it was a gigabyte file or yeah. If you, to move that hundred megabyte yeah, yeah. or seven, yeah, yeah. sorry, 700 so, megabytes. Yeah. To copy that over. Do you need that? Cause what you've built here feels like it could serve mm -hmm. a small to medium sized business, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do you need all that? <laughs> no, so that's, that's how I wanted to wrap up the presentation is to say that, um, <laughs> You can, yeah, I mean, you can, you can also do very robust, like video editing with, with this too, for the speeds that, that it can do. Yeah. Uh, I wanted a fast connection because I am dealing with, with larger files. And when I get a, like a, a shoot, cause I shoot with a phase one hundred megapixel back digital back. And so one shoot could be 60 gigabytes, uh, or more. Um, and so just a copy over would take a long time. If it, if it were over one gigabit, just keep in mind the one gigabit again is about is about 125 megabits per second, which is right. okay, but not that fast. Right. Ten gigabit is ten times that, so that's up up to a gigabyte per second. Um, so it's it's worth. I mean, if it was a factor of two, you know, um, maybe it wouldn't be a big deal, but it's a factor of ten. <laughs> so yeah, 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 it's, absolutely. It's, it's not that hard to set up. It's it's a the switch is like 300 bucks. The cards that go in the Synology might be $100 or so each, something like that. But you're getting way faster speeds. So, but again, to, to, to answer your question a little bit, so you could go, I should have had a slide here, but I, I, I provided a link um, that Frederick will post up for you. And it's actually a pre-filtered link um, on Synology's website, which is filtered for uh, units that support the BTRFS, which is the one that allows you to do the snapshots, which is, I think is very important. And uh, also filtered for, um, I guess, Synology Hybrid RAID and one other thing. But so they also, again, they make like two bay units, right? So let's say you're just getting started, but you want to start off the right way with some kind of nice storage solution. You could get a two bay unit, uh, which again would just mirror. So if you had a 16 terabyte drive, um, you need two 16 terabyte drives, and they would just be a, a copy of one another. Yeah. And then let's say you wanted to have the offsite solution, right? So you could get another one. 
and you could hook it up, go to your mom's house, right? Or your friend's house and just plug it in there to their router and the switch that comes, you know, it's part of most routers. You plug it in there and they talk to each other. Uh, it's pretty easy to set up over, over Synology's quick connect protocol. And so right then you, you, you instantly have two copies and one of them's off site. And okay. that would be less than a thousand bucks probably by the time you pop you, depending on what size drives you want to put in. And, so that can no, be and nothing per month, right? Versus, versus the, the nothing, cloud backup system. That's yeah. a huge point. That's a huge point. Yeah. And then the nice thing about again, with the BTRFS and the way the, the Synology hybrid RAID and everything, let's say you, you, you now want to expand to a bigger unit. You can migrate the drives. So you would take those two drives out of the two bay unit. And you could buy a, a, a five bay or an eight bay unit and put them in there. You have to double check the specs, which ones work with which, but pretty much you can do it with most of them. And then it'll recognize it very quickly. And then you could add some more drives and, and then you're, you're off to the races. You can just keep, keep adding stuff. So it's very expandable. And so I, I like any company that will let you just get in at, at the sort of ground floor with a reasonably priced system. And then you can expand. So it's... Um, yeah, so I, I definitely recommend this idea. There's another company out there called QNAP, which I've, I've never really used, but Synology's operating system seems to get the best reviews. Uh, it's pretty robust. They maintain it really well. It's very secure. I think they had one hacking issue a number of years ago, but they haven't had any problems like that since. Now, so, with 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 the um, setup with the setup that you have dialed in here, which is beautiful, by the way, and and also kudos on the product photography here that you know, with the blue lighting and all that, I love it. You know, it's very cool. Uh, you you got to do it, right? Um, yeah. But yeah, with all this, you know, even with the offsite backup and you know at the friend's house and in all this working together, do you do you not feel the need at all for a third party? cloud backup solution like you know like a backblazer somebody plugged in just to give you that third layer of scorched earth my data still there solution yeah i mean yeah i in the current like i said it's dropbox but those are only the final photos yeah that's, that's for the like final the though yeah yeah it's the final final yeah, yeah. but I'm, so, I'm talking like a mirror yeah. of 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 uh r2d2 you sure. have here you know <laughs> could you have that in the cloud <laughs> I think I just have run into the problem where it's just I don't have um, you can't physically get all the data over there. It just takes too long. Um, and I haven't, you know, because I've got on this system, I think I've got um, over 60 terabytes. Yeah. Yeah. So, that that would take data. that would take time to move <laughs> up there. Uh, but, you know, it, I, right. I love this solution. I'm just saying, if you needed the if you needed the cloud yeah. component to it, like a backblaze. I talked to them at one of these last trade shows, and a salesperson was telling mm -hmm. me four large amounts of data for those customers. You know, they don't expect everyone to be able to fit their fit all their data through a straw. So they have this service where they will either send you drives or you can send them drives, mm -hmm. and they will sideload your backup solution, and then you just connect it to your account, and then it's incremental after that. So. Great, you know. Yeah, that would be definitely a good way to do it. Yeah, I think if you're maybe you're just getting started in, in your business and and you're looking. So I would say if you can implement something like this, a network attached storage, and then plus what Frederick's talking about, that you would have you would sleep very soundly at night. You're done. Um, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything would, would be taken care of. And I didn't talk too much about the the other advantage of this. Like you you can you know log into it from anywhere, right? I, mm -hmm. I can connect to any of these machines and poke around and. Uh, download files right from it, um, you know, depending on whatever connection I'm on where I am. But uh, so it's, and if you uh, do it's, that, it's what's what, what's that what's that workflow? So if you if you're in a hotel room, like what what's your level of of access to the data? Can you boot up in DaVinci Resolve or uh, and you know capture one and you know get to work there? I know you're going to be dependent on whatever the local internet connection is, but could you theoretically just operate on a remote? location just like you were sitting in your living room well the only thing i've tried so far is just downloading like uh, individual files and then doing something with them in photoshop and then okay you know, then yeah. they would be down to the local uh thing you couldn't really work like rem you could work directly off of it when you're on your local network um but yeah working off of it remotely certainly over probably a slow connection and probably over wi-fi i don't think it would work very well i think you yeah, could probably yeah. try to I don't know that it would work. Yeah. Uh, so, but in terms of having access to some, some, you know, somebody says, "Oh, can you fix something on that file?" I could easily have access to it and then work on it and then upload it back to the Synology and deliver it to the client if, yeah. um, if needed. So, 
Yeah, and right now Brian is on, and Brian's the way just the way that set it up without going into too much detail. So he does work he's working on my photos versus ones that, that he takes. Um, he actually works directly off the Synology and he does say it's a little bit slow. Um, but like I, I found once capture one sort of fully previews everything, then it usually works a little bit better. Okay. But Synology just added a new thing to the uh, drive, their drive application. So you can, you have to set up this uh, sync task, but you can basically let in your Mac, uh, it works on PC too, but uh, I only use Macs. Uh, in your Macs finder sidebar, you basically would have a folder, whichever folder you target on the Synology, and it would just sit there you click on it and you'd see everything that's in the folder would have a little cloud symbol next to it. And, and as soon as you tell, you do like a right click on the folder and say download, and it physically moves the data from the Synology locally to your Mac. It can't do it on any external device to your Mac. It has to be on the hard drive in the Mac. But it would move it right to the Mac, and then you could start working on it. But it's still in, in the background as part of the Synology, and it, it continues to sync. So okay, it's, okay. It's like, is like that a move? Copy. Is it a move or is it a copy? Is it like a? Like, it's a. It's a, it's not moving it off of the Synology, but it's yeah. making a. It's a it, connected it's copy though, copy. right? Copy. It's a con yeah, in it's that. A the, yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I've never seen that before. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's that's a new feature, and it's still a little buggy. Um, we've had. Uh, it's a little fits and starts. We've only been working with it for the last few weeks, but I'm sure it'll get better. Some of it has to do with you know the Mac OS, I'm sure, in terms of how uh, how smoothly it works. But yeah, uh, it's a nice yeah. idea. So you can easily, um, so if you were working on something like a larger video file or something, it would take a few minutes to download it to your your Mac hard drive. But then you would work on it as if it's natively there because it is it is natively there, but it's just still like you said connected back. Right. To, right. Um, so I'll really cool. just go managing the sync on it. Yeah. And then yeah, when you're done with it, you can just undo download and then it would just, whoosh, and just disappear. And it's done. And, okay. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Cool. Uh, so here, here's a, yeah. Are you, if you're complete with your slides, I have the million dollar question mm -hmm. for you at the end. So are you yeah. ready for it? Uh -huh. What's, uh -huh. what's the cost of this? So I want to know. I want to know <laughs> what, yeah, what the enclosures, you know, what sans the drives mm -hmm. in them, you know, just the empty enclosures. What, what does that run? And then what is that with the drives and what capacity? What I know you may have said it, but what's your max capacity on, on R2D2 here? Uh, we're right now that they're populated for, uh, they each have uh, 16 terabyte drives in them. So that's Ugh. 8 times 16 terabyte. Yeah. But you lose one one chunk of 16 terabyte to the parity okay. right so so seven times 16 so it's roughly like 100 terabytes um and i'm just looking up the cost of these things here so uh the un my eight day unit there the 1221 plus sells for 1300 bucks mm -hmm. and with the drives and then you could put whatever drives you think you want to use in there but 16 terabyte ones are not cheap but i built them up slowly like i didn't i didn't just buy 24 16 terabyte drives at one time yeah um but i had had one unit then I had another unit then i had another unit and a lot of them started out with smaller hard drives um and i like the um the seagate iron wolves and let's see what those are running these days from bmh oh so like a, a 16 terabyte uh from uh, C8 Iron Wolf, which is a mass rated hard drive, which is what you want because these things are constantly spinning. So mm -hmm. you do want ones that are rated. And so Western Digital, I think they're, you know, they're they have a color code system. They got into trouble because their reds were meant to be mass rated, but I think someone discovered that they weren't or they were rebranded something else drives. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, but the, don't quote me on that, but some, there was something sketchy with that. Yeah. So like a uh, six. A uh, terabyte Iron Wolf uh, NAS drive is, is right now 250 bucks from B and H. So, uh, but if you want again, I'm thinking more of the person who's uh, who maybe is just getting started, starting to trip over their hard drives uh, falling off their desk, and like I need a, a, a better solution for this. You know, you could probably start with two 16 terabyte drives in a bay enclosure and be covered for a while. <laughs> you know, yeah, 16 no, terabytes. Sure. Is um, so yeah, for not for not huge bunny. Um, so like, let me look at one of these. Um, Cause I was, while you're looking that up, like one of my questions is um, 
like to the to the some of the people that are watching this i know and i know who you are there's some people that are watching this that are saying <laughs> you know what i could just go buy you know two terabyte drives off of you know on a best buy and keep swapping those out and copy this and you know all that why do i need why do i need r2d2 to solve you know which is a smaller data problem i don't know what, what would you say to that person that's uh that's fighting with well that? I think if, if you're in the business of creating data, your small data problem is going to be a big data problem. You know, unless you don't <laughs> care answer. about keeping it. <laughs> it, does, yeah. it does just keep growing. Uh, and then, yeah. you know, I mean, that stuff I've been accessing a long time, but I do have it. I mean, I did just search for a job that was 20 years old and I was able to find it quite easily. Um, so yeah. you never know what you're going to, what you're going to. And I do sell images as, you know, um, stock. I don't sell generic stock, but I sell stock. Someone's coming around, looking at a contractor, somebody who's working on a project might be a lighting manufacturer or something. So it's, it, it definitely is beneficial to me to keep everything accessible because we do, um, just generate income off of, off of stock sales. So yeah. part of it certainly offset, offset by that. So, yeah. So again, I don't want to intimidate people say this is too fancy because like you could, like you could, there are two different plus units that that Synology makes one's 300 bucks and one's 450 that are two bay enclosures. And so one's expandable, one's not. So the, so you could, you could actually expand, you could buy a two bay and get an expansion unit and then you have a, a seven, uh, seven bay unit. Oh, okay. So the expansion units are, are nice, but they have to be on a separate volume. So it might be weird to have like one volume that's on the two bay and another volume that's on the five bay. So it might just be better just to move up to a different machine if you fill up if you fill that up, but there are also twenty terabyte um, drives available these days. So are there twenty terabytes? We're terabyte up to twenty out. terabyte dri yeah. single drives. Wow! It's, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. So you'd be quite happy with a with a two bay, um, and then you know, and more much more affordably be able to get a second two bay as an offsite. Yeah, and if you're yeah. if you're okay with the with you if you're okay with all my all my eggs in one basket scenario, right? Because two drives, well, you know, it's a lot of data to go away. Yeah, well, that's well, that's where the um, yeah they would be mirrored, so you'd they'd have be to, mirrored. You'd yeah. have yeah, so that that's how they would that's how Synology would set that up. But yeah. uh, there's all kinds of things you can do um, with Synology. I mean, this is just barely scratching the surface. There's tons of apps you can run surveillance cameras off of them. You can. Um, you can run Plex servers uh, if you do your um, media server off of it. You can do all kinds of stuff. So, wow, um, wow, definitely, definitely cool. So I thought it'd just be helpful to show because um, I went through a lot of iterations of this kind of stuff over the years, and I finally feel like this one's working well. And if you do work with a partner of some kind, or maybe even uh, fortunate enough, to maybe you uh, you uh, live up north in the summer and down south in the winter, um, you could have all your data in both places that you live at all times. Yeah. So you could, what uh, a dream. Yeah. What yeah, a dream so in, in this, in this day and age. Right. Or if, you know, like you're fortunate enough to be bi coastal or have multiple residences or whatever, you know, maybe you just go over, yeah. you know, and spend time with the family for three months out of the year, you know, and you have your data, mm -hmm. everything that you need yep. in order to be productive. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, we'll that's that. great. That's the Holy grail. Yep. So when we, we need to do another one of these with a slightly less ambition, ambitious version of R2D2. <laughs> yeah, this, yeah. this is <laughs> like, I look at this, I mean, regardless of the price, but I look at this, it looks simple because uh -huh. I've seen wildly complex mm -hmm. versions of this. This is elegant. I can see this in my, in my house or my garage or my closet yeah. or whatever. Yeah, it doesn't look intimidating, but I was wondering, like, there's a lot of headroom here for the average photographer that's, you know, that's shooting, maybe even someone that's shooting weddings or something. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, that's doing that level of work. I don't know. Maybe I don't shoot weddings, so I don't know. Maybe this is the dream configuration yeah. for wedding photographers, uh, especially the, yeah, the remote absolutely. connectivity part of it for third parties that need to access into the data. Yeah. So as I think through it, yeah. I'm convincing myself that that's a great, <laughs> I should use that yeah. solution. Yeah. 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 And the more, the more I think about it, like I think for a lot of people, the, the two bay box would go a long way with 20 terabytes yeah. in one box. Right. Yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah. realize drives were at. I didn't realize drives were at twenty terabytes. I remember when they were one. Mm -hmm. and I'm dating myself, but I'm like one, right. and then I the know. twos uh, came okay. out. Oh, yeah. Right, and you're like two yeah. terabytes in really. one drive. That's ridiculous, you know. And then on up yeah, from totally there nuts. to twenty terabytes. That's crazy. 
Yeah. Okay. But yeah. you're going to pay for that 20 terabytes, but you know, it's still 20 terabytes. Yeah. It might be five, five, four or 500 bucks. I don't even know what they are, but I haven't gotten one yet. I, I'm mm -hmm. sticking with the 16s for now because that's what's in everything. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's worth exploring. Um, if anybody wants to get in touch with me about it or, or, or learn from Will on his uh, YouTube channel, he's got, he's got loads of, loads of videos. He can walk you right through the whole setup, which, um, yeah, a lot of it's just one, one time that you can, once you have it set up, um, it's, it's not hard to set up. It, it gets a little more complex if you really want to exploit all the best features and, and, you know, do, do a, a multi-box setup with, you know, syncing back and forth. It's not that hard, but you just want to make sure you're using the right strategy. Um, yeah. So no, that, absolutely. Which, primary which one's copying over which folders are targeted anything like yeah. that so very yeah. good so cool yeah, well thanks jeffrey for that Frederick. thank you thank you for putting that together that's fantastic uh, and very helpful and sure, and and a hundred percent timely considering like i said i'm i'm limping along yeah. on impulse drive now <laughs> so i gotta uh -huh. <laughs> i gotta figure i gotta figure out my situation so this is perfect so clearly yeah. synology looks like like a great a great way to go so i was looking at i you know of course synology was on the list and then owc was on the list um and one other right. i forget i think you mentioned the other one but there were three storage providers in the list I've, I've yeah qnap thank you yeah so uh -huh. i've heard i've heard from more than one photographer that have as you know decided on synology as the sort of the baseline this is where my data is going to live for the foreseeable future solution so mm -hmm. you just kind of right. you know put another nail in that in that wall so that's great yeah yeah cool that's no, good yeah i definitely recommend. and i've been running this system for, for about a year so it's mm -hmm. um pretty much Flawless. We haven't had any any snafus really. Not going. With, um, we've had a couple of slowdown things, but we'll fix that this morning. There was just some port setting that wasn't right. Um, and uh, yeah, so so far so good. And you have it. You have it plugged into a UPS, right? Yeah, that's a good point. So yeah, it, it does plug into. I'm not showing the bottom of the rack here, just because. Um, so yeah, I have a, a cyber power UPS that can, that can easily power that. And then the house is on a generator, so the the. Um, which I got because my, I run my office out of here. And there was mm -hmm. uh, well, five days a couple years ago where we were out without power and that was hard. Um, yeah, and we don't have cell phone coverage. We don't have power either, so that's bad. So um, yeah, so the UPS works, uh, only has to be on for you know about two minutes before the generator kicks on, but it's still good to have that. And the, the Synologies are smart, so they connect, you connect one of them to the UPS with the USB cable and then that becomes the UPS uh, server. And then the other units can talk. So when that one knows that the UPS went on, it tells the other ones that the UPS went on. And then they all can oh. implement their or shutdown after a five minute protocol or whatever you have it set to. Oh, so see, they, very that's, that's, that's yeah. another, you know, I've learned something new every day because yeah. I'm thinking archaic UPS systems that, that you know, would, when they detect a power outage, they instantly click on and whatever's connected to them, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't know, right? It's just that it just stays on for an additional amount of time and hopefully you have time to go shut your computers and everything and down safely. Yeah. So it gives you that buffer time. I had no idea that there was a data connection that would from the ups tell tell yeah i didn't know that it'll tell the it'll tell yeah. the synology to hey power's gone initiate protocol z right you can do it with your with your mac too if you one um most of the apc apc ups's um they'll have a, a data cable just a usb cable you plug it into your mac and you go to the um the power settings and the preferences and there's a UPS uh, tab there, and it'll recognize that the UPS is connected. And then you can tell it, like, well, if if we're out of power for more than five minutes, shut it down. How so, did I not know this? Like, oh, well. Yeah, it's so cool. But the I did not know this. Where it, can, it can use hive mind to say, all right, all your other synologies, all right, we're going to shut down together. All right, one, two, three, go to sleep. <laughs> wow. So, wow. Yeah, see, yeah. this is me coming from the, the refugee world of Drobo. Drobo had nothing like that, you know, that, that was that nope. smart. Yeah. No, the Drobo was out in the wind. Yeah, the Drobo was in the wind as far as I knew, like if, yeah. um, if the power went out. Yeah. 
No, absolutely. Yeah, yeah what, what what happened with Drobos is I'm, I'm going to say millions of people, whoever's listening to this that has a Drobo is going to raise their hand when I say this. Uh, if you've been in this situation with power fluctuations, especially at the beginning of the Drobo journey, it would, notorious for frying your power supply, you know, so right. which would mean you're, you know, it would kind of work. So lights would come on on the Drobo and make you think that it was getting power, but it wasn't getting enough power. So you just thought your mm -hmm. your drive pack was fried at that point right so there's no kind of intelligence to tell you or to intelligently shut down or even message you you know it would it would email you if things came right. up as you know but not like that so yeah that's fantastic yeah 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 cool. so that's that's definitely that's a question about the ups yeah that's that's just the bottom of the rack because it weighs so much yeah yeah all right. Well, if, if people want to check out your work, aside from, you know, your your amazing mm -hmm. infrastructure IT setup in the basement there, if you want to see your photography <laughs> work and all that, what's a what's a good location for them to go to? Sure. My, my newly updated website, uh, JeffreyTotaro.com. And uh, I'm at, uh, at Jeffrey Totaro on Instagram. Um, and yeah, so we, we just updated the website with a bunch of new photos uh, a few weeks ago. So it's uh, got some got some fresh content on there finally. Very cool. That's all right. All yeah. right, my friend. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. That was fantastic. Thank you. I think that, Thank you that'll that. be helpful yeah, to a lot it. of a lot of people out there. We'll will get something out of that, myself included. So thank you. Thanks again for doing that. Good. I hope it's helpful. Yep. Okay. Pleasure. All right. Take care. Jim. This is Twitter.